these three gentlemen. Uh, another thing, if you do start a commotion and if you do get pretty loud, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Thank you. Um, to my left, to your right, is uh, Rabbi Goldstein. He's a rabbi at Hillel. He's a director of Hillel right across the street. He's also an instructor at Los Angeles Valley College. Also, we have Professor Zeb Garber. He's the uh, Jewish study chairman at Los Angeles Valley College, and he's also a Jewish study teacher. And this always gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Rasha Deem. He's the West Coast Regional Minister for the Honorary Elijah Muhammad of the National Islam. He's also Associate Professor of Pan-African Studies at Cal State Los Angeles. He has traveled extensively throughout Europe and Africa. Two times lecturing at South Africa, special guest for two years of the Uganda President Idi Amin. He has traveled two times to Israel, four times to Egypt, and three times to Mecca. Would you please join me in introducing Dr. Rock? Rabbi Ghostin, start first. Good morning. I'm concerned about all of you who have to stand in the back. Would it be any easier to, I don't know, maybe to sit up front or something? Um, okay. Um, I am uh, genuinely pleased to be here today. Um, I came in response to an invitation to participate in a uh, commemoration of Martin Luther King's birthday. Um, this day has become an ever increasingly uh, important day to all Americans who are concerned with, with the principles of justice and democracy and, and, and fairness to all people who live in America. Martin Luther King was one of the great Americans whose birthday deserves national attention. It deserves to be regarded as a, a national holiday. And I'm one of those who would certainly promote its establishment as an official legal holiday. I think that recalling the message of his life and the, and the burden of his death calls all of us to work ever harder for for increased appreciation of one another, for the gifts we have, and for the opportunity to make this country what it is meant to be, a country of freedom and justice for all. Um, we were asked today to talk about who and what is the chosen people. Um, that's a, um, a theological category. Um, it's a... Um, uh, the chosen people doctrine is a is an article in in the belief system of the of the Jewish people. Uh, it's a doctrine of belief which is important uh, important for Jews to understand, and I think it's important for non-Jews to understand as well. But let me be very very clear at the outset: when Jews assert that they are a chosen people as indeed we do, that is never ever meant in any sense that we feel ourselves superior to anybody. There is no sense in the Jewish people's chosen, chosenness doctrine, any sense whatsoever that anybody else is inferior. For us, what it means to be a, a chosen people has always meant a sense of mission, a sense of responsibility. Um, let me share with you just before I go any further some of the words that you can find in, in the Jewish prayer book. Um, I, I think that it, it, I mean the, the, the whole direction of, of Jewish self-understanding has always meant that Jews as a chosen people must work to eliminate oppression in the world, must work to raise the standards of justice, must work to express compassion for all underprivileged, 
for all, uh, all people who are in need of help to be part of the, the priestly people, the Jewish people, means a Jew must be philanthropic, must be compassionate, must be bound by, by the yoke of Torah, as we say. Um, this is the way one of the morning services that, Jew, that Jews have in the prayer book begins. <coughs> of course, a lot of our prayers use Hebrew, but uh, let me share it with you in, in English. Um, the service begins like this. And now, O Israel, what is it that the Lord your God demands of you? To revere the Lord our God, to walk always in His ways, to love and serve Him with heart and soul. And now, therefore, if you will truly keep my covenant, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy people. Her expanding notion of what it would mean to be a Jew. I think there are ups and downs in it. For instance, it's pretty clear that although my people, 3,000 years ago, 3,200 years ago, were slaves in Egypt, I mean, it's awfully clear to me that the Jews who four generations after Abraham left the promised land and went to Egypt in a time of famine became imprisoned and became slaves. Uh, and uh, I, mean, I, I have to, to tell that story because it's very important in Jewish self-consciousness. That our people really formed into a people during that time of, of slavery. Uh, for, for several hundred years we lived in Egypt and were slaves. Um, building, building the monuments of Egyptian society uh, until Moses, one of the greatest of all the Jewish leaders ever, came along and uh, a fabulous personality, a genius, a spiritual genius, a giant among all human beings in the world, inspired by his dedication to God, knowing that it was terrible for any people to be oppressed, and certainly knowing that it was terrible for his own people to be oppressed, led them forth from their slavery in Egypt, led them through the wilderness in Sinai, led them to Mount Sinai and presented them with a, a code, a code for behavior. That code for behavior, which we're inclined to call the Torah, the teachings is epitomized often as the Ten Commandments, but it's far more than that. It would be all right if people would follow those Ten Commandments. That might be a good start. But there's far more to Judaism and far more to following after God than, than just keeping the Ten Commandments. Um, but Moses formed up this Jewish people not as a band of ex-slaves, but as a band of people who would be dedicated to serving God. Serving God through, through certain customs and ceremonies to be sure. Thank you. If you have to leave, you can leave right now in between the breaks. This will be last speaker. If you get out of hand, I'm going to ask you to leave. Okay, it gives me great pleasure again to introduce uh, Mr. Zeb Garber. One of the advantages of following another speaker... <clears throat> One of the advantages of following another speaker who, presented, who presents his opinion about a certain religious tradition <clears throat> is that I do not have to retrace some of the concepts that were presented in the name of Judaism and consequently would have the freedom, as it were, to develop other notions which might not have been able to have been develop, developed effectively in the course of a general presentation regarding the topic Judaism as Jews understand that religion to be a chosen people. Let me begin with a certain apology and also a very important position that I must take. What you're going to hear for the next 40 minutes is one man's opinion about Judaism. 
What you're going to hear is one man's understanding of a religious heritage that flows in my very veins and in my very bones that goes back metaphorically 4,000 years. What you're going to hear in the next 40 minutes is only one person's understanding of a religious heritage to which he was born into and also a religious civilization which this individual, namely myself, has chosen to have as my lifestyle until the day I leave this world. What you're going to hear is going to be a little disturbing to some, and what you're going to hear articulates, it might not be what you want to hear as representative of Judaism. I can only say in my opening remarks that this is my own opinion, these are my own feelings, and from that point of view, I would expect that you would respect what I have to say, for it's one man's viewpoint, one man's thinking process that's going forth. Rabbi Jerry Goldstein made reference to a significant holiday of the Jewish year referred to as Yom Kippur. He also made reference to a concept referred to as Teshuvah. The concept of Yom Kippur, 24 books of the Hebrew Bible, is a very strange message. It tells the story of a certain Jew by Jonah, his name, to go to a people referred to as the Assyrians. The Assyrians were a classic people of the ancient Near East, and among their accomplishments, they were able to stomp out and step upon to use the terminology which I feel comfortable with today to snuff out different civilizations and different peoples. The Assyrians were also the great destroyers of my people's ancient past. If there is a small Jewish people today, it is because Jews in the course of history and Jews where every geographical space they were able to inhabit were exposed to and thus victimized by crusades, inquisitions, exterminations, and in our own recent memory, the greatest destruction ever inflicted upon any people, the Holocaust. And between 1933 and 1945, the slaughter of one-third of my people called the Jews. As the world participated either actively or not actively, and thus were complacent to the greatest murder ever recorded in recorded history. The Assyrians destroyed ten of the twelve tribes of ancient Israel. If there are Jews today, it is because one or two of these tribes were able to manage and able to survive. But the Assyrians were the great Nazis of their day, and they destroyed ten of the twelve tribes of Israel. And consequently, on this particular day of Yom Kippur, the Jew reads a book. It's a book which is very simple. It's a book which consists only of four chapters. It is a book of a Jew who's told to go to Assyria and to preach this very term that Jerry introduced, namely Teshuvah. The is I personally feel the history of the Jewish people, and let this be known as factual, and it's not myth. The Jews are mankind's longest surviving people with a continuous history. There's no other people in this world who has a continuous memory as the Jewish people has. And maybe for that reason, if the world no longer has a Jew, the world would be dwarfed in absence of the presence of a consciousness called the Jews. It doesn't mean that the Jews are superior, and it doesn't mean that the Jews are inferior. It simply means that the Jews have something about themselves which they take self-pride in, and that something, if you will, has been contributed to mankind. What does it say to me, this chosen people business? It says, hey, I'm important. It says, hey, I've got pride. It says, hey, I've got a heritage. It says, I am meaningful. I'm not just another number, another face in the crowds. If the other cannot respond to it, that is his problem or her problem. It ought not be my problem. On the blackboards, I put several terms. The self and the other, the I and the is. I am the self, if you will, because I'm talking from my vantage points. When I respond to the other, I do not think... Some of you are Gentiles. By this I mean you come from a non-Jewish background. And this type of rhetoric sounds too militant, maybe, sounds too weird, too off the board. You don't know Jews who talk this way. Jews do talk this way, and the tragedy is that Jews ought to impress their messages upon others. Because if you want a track record that's able to survive, it is this type of Jewish mentality. It doesn't mean that the Jew is superior, nor does it mean that the Jew is inferior. All he's saying by all this rhetoric is, I am just as important as you. And by saying that, he helps himself and has the obligation. Jacob has his curses. From the birth until the end, every significant episode about the patriarch Jacob is introduced by a curse. Jacob masters the curse, converts it into a blessing. Try to follow me right now. The paragon of Jacob is very, very important for me. It's very important for Jews. They call themselves after Jacob. They call themselves Israel. Jacob is first Israel. When his name is changed, your name will no longer be Jacob. It will be called Israel. 
When Jacob called Israel a curse, you have to understand what happens. I'm not going to be scientific because I can't be scientific. But at the same time, however non-rational I might sound to all of you, Zev Garber is not anti-rational about the preference of the God of Israel. Jews cannot have that opinion in my cannot have that position in my opinion because of the historical awareness of Jews that the all-powerful God and the God of promises can oftentimes be embarrassed by questions of how is it that the innocent seem to suffer and how is it that Holocaust seems to occur to every little Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob being destroyed the way they were. Because to take that position from a Jewish point of view would imply that God and the devil, as it were, Hitler and others, our handshakes together are partners in the destruction of innocence. Hence, I feel comfortable with that teaching of Judaism, which is the very root of what we're talking about, that says you're not an amen sayer of God's, that says that God creates the imperfect world and it's man's job to make it perfect, which says that man and God are partners. God did his job. Man, you now do your job. That says that God creates and man redeems, that de-emphasizes the creed and plays up the deeds that that's the bottom line. You fight with gods. You hear the phrase, Israel. Fighting with man and also constantly fighting with gods. And because you know that you're valuable, in the end, you prevail. You want to know something, people? That's what God wants. And when you don't fight with gods, then you ain't doing your Jewish thing. Am Yisrael. If there's one phrase you'll learn from my rhetoric, it's this phrase. Um, the nation is Israel. Call Jews what you want. Kikes, Makis, Jews. They've been known by all kinds of names. The one name that people, so to speak, aren't aware of, that is pristine, that is original, is this phrase transliterated into English as Am Yisrael. You are a nation, Israel. You're a people. You are the people that fights with man and fights with God. The word am, dear people, if I write it in Hebrew, also spells out the Hebrew phrase together and with togetherness. What is a Jew? It is the sum total of religion, culture, spiritual, physical, national, ethnic, everything. Togetherness makes Israel. And it's that unity of diversity which is what I understand to be the chosen concept and why Jews have the track record that they do. <clears throat> Jews are mankind's eternal people. one point from my point of view, I would like to say, um, I hope people don't get the impression that this is a fight or this is, a, this is a learning institution here and we're here to learn from each speaker. So I hope you don't get the impression that this person's right, this person's wrong. So we're just all here to learn. So that's why I just want to make the point. Um, for the people who came in late, I'd like to introduce our next speaker again. He's a West Coast Regional Minister for the National for the uh, Elijah, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad of the National Islams, National Islams. Thank you. <laughs> He's Associate Professor of Pan-African Studies at Cal State Los Angeles. He has traveled extensively throughout Europe, Asia, and Africa. Two times lecturing in South Africa, special guest for two years for I I Uganda President Idi Amin. Two times traveled to Israel, four times to Egypt, and three times to Mecca. Would you come welcome Dr. Rashadi?
Ashford. Ken Ashford. Yeah. Brother Ken Ashford. Sister Cherie X. Brothers and sisters of the Black Student Union. Members of the Jewish community. Brothers and sisters. Rabbi Jerry Goldstein. Professor Zeb Garber. This is a very important topic that has been chosen for us. We are taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that we should begin everything in the name of God. So in the name of Allah, we came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, to whom praise is due forever. And we forever thank Allah for raising in our midst the black man and black woman of America, a divine leader, a divine teacher, and surely a divine guide in the person of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And we thank Allah and his messenger for preparing a champion for the black man and black woman's cause, the most dynamic and charismatic and certainly the guide of our day, made that way by God and his messenger, Minister Louis Farrakhan. In their names, I greet you with the greeting words of peace. I salam alaikum. And to others, shalom alaikum. The topic is the chosen people. What a topic. Before we can go into the chosen people, we have to ask, who's doing the choosing? <laughs> because, as Professor Garber has said, he spoke from his own individual point of view. There would be others, if we had everyone to speak, who would speak from their own individual point of view. Everybody would, as the old folks say among black people, everybody would pick and choose. Now what we want to know is, Who's doing the choosing? What are they choosing for? And we've got to look at the old scripture that says, as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the ending. Now, what beginning? Who's beginning? The beginning of what? So it is proper for us to begin at the beginning. Right. Judaism would not exist if Africa did not exist. Islam would not exist if Africa did not exist. Christianity would not exist if Africa did not exist. And the white man and white woman himself and herself, and I certainly mean no disrespect, but you were warned that you must honor your mother and your father, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord has The white man, the white man and the white woman be they Jew or Gentile, and let's get that mess straight before we even get started. Every Caucasian, every white man and woman who is not a Jew is a Gentile. Now let's take a look at it. When we study what is called etymology, the origin, the beginning, or the root of terms and terminology, isn't it interesting? That the root the base or the root, the prefix of the term. Gentile is the same as the prefix, the base, base or the root of the term general. All white folks who do not ascribe and believe to the tenets of Ju Judaism are considered white folks in general. <laughs> They're considered Gentiles. I mean, there's no question about it. Now, let us proceed. Since we've got that out of the way and got that straight, mm -hmm. 
we don't have to especially, except for specific purposes during these few moments, separate the Jew from other white folks. All white folks are white folks. Yes. Right. <laughs> but for specific purposes and to adhere to the debate topic, we will have to make a distinction because the Jews have indeed caught hell all over the world. That people that are called Jews today. Let me put that on the board. If, if it's not insulting to anyone, and even if it is, I have to say, so called Jew. And then I'm going to go after this thing. So called Jew. You see, the Jew is indeed an ancient people. That's right. The Jew is indeed an original people. But the question is, are you the real Jew? Yes. The question is, those of you of light pigmentation and white pigmentation, are you that original Jew from Abraham and from Moses? That's the question. That's the question that we hope to answer today. Because when you hide behind the term Jew, you are hiding behind something that the cover has to be pulled off of today. Now, the Jew has caught hell, the so-called Jew, the white Jew, has caught hell all over the planet Earth. No one can deny that. But now the question is, why has the white Jew caught hell? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad, under the searchlight of truth, shows us why the white Jew has caught hell. He teaches us that the white Jew has caught hell because you represent that group or that circle of people who adhered to the laws and the teachings and the customs that Moses brought to you. That Moses actually gave you a sense of civilization. Moses actually gave to you a sense of culture. And Moses actually gave to you an edge on the rest of the Gentiles. Right. Your adherence to what Moses taught you puts you out front. Right. And when you're out front and the spotlight is on you, mm -hmm. you meet with the anger, the resentment, the jealousy, and the scorn of your other white sister and brother. Right. Yeah. Who is this? chosen people. What beginning can we ascribe to them? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that the white man and white woman are biologically and genetically a grafted mutant people who come up out of the original black man and white woman. It is biologically and genetically impossible for the recessive white man and recessive white woman, Muhammad teaches us, to produce the dominant yellow baby. Right. It is biologically and genetically impossible for the recessive yellow man and yellow woman to produce the dominant brown baby. Right. It is biologically and genetically impossible for the recessive brown man and woman to produce the dominant black baby. But that black man and the black woman, they can be blue black, purple black. Black is 150 million midnight. They can be as black as they can be. And no matter how black they are, if the seed runs wild, or what they call scientifically, and since everybody hasn't been scientific, I think I should be. The root of the term science comes from the term seal, which means to know. We can't just get up here and run off at the mouth and give some personal opinion. We're dealing with the lives of the people of the planet Earth. We can't just get up here and talk. This is just me. So what? It's just you. We want science, and science comes from the root, which means to know. We've got to have facts. And before this is over, you will see that this is not the ranting of a, uh, an angry, hateful, resentful, wild-eyed, bald-headed militant. <laughs> but you will meet with unmistakable, irrefutable, 
undeniable and indisputable facts, proof, and evidence, and then we'll have an opportunity to question it before you go. Amen. Now, go ahead, brother. the black man and black woman, if the seed runs wild in the womb of the black woman, or mutates, from that mutation, she can even produce an albino, right. something that is 180 degrees different from both of them. Right. In that black man and black woman, you can find brown, you can find red, you can find yellow, and you can even produce that which is whiter than white. Right. That is why when you go among black people, I know it's been amazing and, and has really, really puzzled most white folks here in the audience, is to see so many shades of black people. Right. And all of them supposed to be black. Here's one black, black, black. Here's another one medium black. Here's another one light black. Here's another one teasing tan. Here's another one caramel brown. Here's another one that's bright, as they say, damn near white. And another one whiter than that. Here comes another one with blue eyes. Here comes another one with green eyes. Here comes one with brown eyes. You say, wow, these people, they look like everybody. Why do these black people look like everybody? You can go among the black people and you can find the likeness of the Chinese there. You can go among the black people and find the likeness of the Japanese there. You can go among the black people and find the likeness of the European among them. Why is this? Because the black man and the black woman are absolutely the original people of the planet Earth. We are indeed your father and your mother. And you would not be here if it were not for us. It's fitting that this be done on Dr. King's birthday. Because we love Dr. King, right. and we love the work that Dr. King did in sincerity. But Dr. King was wrong, and we must assess his wrongness in his proper light. Another subject for another time. Dr. King would not have agreed to what you are clapping to. <coughs> and you know I'm telling you the truth. Dr. King held hands with the so-called Jew or the white Jew. And we want to see if what the rabbi said is indeed true, that the Jew has actually worked with us, marched with us, <laughs> held hands with Jesse Jackson, <laughs> held hands with the late Dr. Martin Luther King, held hands with uh, the Urban League man, Vernon Jordan and Roy Wilkins, and how the Jews have supported black causes. We, 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 we suffer like you. We, 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 we've been persecuted. We, we understand the, 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 the black people's plight. I want to hold my point. No, you have a question at the end. Just a second. What's fair for everybody, when those two gentlemen spoke, everybody was obedient, they listened quietly, they came to learn. Now, I'm listening to you and I want to learn from you. But I find that we're having rabble rousers inside of something instead of me trying to learn from you. Like this young gentleman said, we're here to learn. We're not here to cause... But we can't keep the audience from responding. No, I agree with you. I agree with you, but it is not a fair assimilation. What do you the mean? gentleman said so. We're here to learn. Look. And I'm there to learn from you. Please have Are a seat. Hungry? And let us proceed. We aren't having any problems. It's moving along smoothly. <laughs> All right. No, ma'am, I'm not going to take any questions until I'm finished. Nobody else took questions. That's right. That's right. That's right. What do you mean I'm not talking on the subject? I'm supposed to speak on the chosen people. That's the topic. Is that the topic? Is that the topic? That is the topic. Let's, let's, let's have the audience quiet. You can't have the audience quiet. They love the truth. Respond if you choose. The Jew, the so-called Jew, is not used to losing and never wants it to appear that there is superior knowledge on the scene. Never. Let's go after this. Yes, sir. 
I want to hold that point on the Jews and whether they have really worked behind our causes and the cause for them working behind our causes. That's right. I want to hold that. I want to go back to the chosen people, the original people of God. When we look at it, as we said earlier, you can find the likeness of every people on the earth in the black man and in the black woman. But you haven't been in a white meeting and find all kinds of shades of people sitting up in the meeting. Here's a real, real black one sitting over in the corner and a Jewish mother and a Jewish father claim that real black nappy head went over in the corner and say that he's a Jew or that he's white from their loins. But you, black man and woman, produce all, you produce every color in the color spectrum because that is a sign in you from Almighty God to let you know that you are the father and mother of it all. That's right. Amen. This being the case, and this being true, we want to go back to the role of Africa in the rise of Judaism. The role of Africa in the rise of Judaism. Abraham was mentioned, and Moses was mentioned. Let us take a look at these two great ones and see what we can find on Abraham and Moses. When we look at Abraham and Moses, we find Abraham, sometimes called the original Jew, grew up in Ur, a city in Chaldea, according to Genesis 11, 27 through 29, or what is called today, as they will bear me witness, Mesopotamia which was east of what it was called Palestine. The ancient inhabitants were the Sumerians, who just like the early Canaanites, the Natufians, were noted as being of African ancestry. Come on. According to Professor W.J. Perry, the myths, legends, and traditions of the Sumerians include their origin as Ethiopia also. That in fact, and in effect, the Kushites, the Sumerians, were one and the same people. Come on. The Sumerians established the earliest civilization of that region. They started agricultural practices, including irrigation, built cities, tended cattle, and invented a form of writing, all inherited by the Semitic inhabitants. At the age of 75, according to the Old Testament, Abraham, accompanied by his wife Sarah, and a small band of Herubas or Hebrews, meaning crossed over, they entered Egypt as the result of a great famine in Canaan, according to Genesis 12, 4 through 10. Possibly to wait until conditions improved at home, but left Egypt soon after. Following Sarah's death, Abraham took on another wife, Keturah, who was definitely an African, according to Genesis 25. And one. And the children of that union, Zimran, Jakshan, Medan, Median, Ishkba, and Shuka must have been African in appearance if this his child by Sarah, Isaac also. Also, the Bible relates that Abraham made a child named Ishmael by Hagar, an African maid of Sarah's, who was most likely African too. From what has been mentioned about the history of the Canaan region, it's possible that all of Abraham's descendants were African. Now, many go on to say that Moses was a Jew. <laughs> Moses very clearly was an Egyptian. And the very Torah that the so-called Jew believes in bears witness that Moses was indeed an Egyptian. Let us turn to Exodus and see if Moses was a Jew or an Egyptian. Second chapter of Exodus, the 19th through the 21st verses. Let's take a look at it. And they came to Ruel, their father, is the seven daughters of Ruel. This is after Moses, who didn't practice nonviolence. When Moses found the people being persecuted, Moses killed one of the ones who was persecuting the people. And then he had to flee for his life. 
And there he got refuge in the land where Ruel was, and he had seven daughters. And the father asked his daughters, how is it that you, how is it that you are come so soon? You come back so quickly today. And they said, an Egyptian, who? Egyptian. An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds, drove the shepherds away, and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. And he said unto his daughters, and where is this Egyptian? Why is it that you have left a man behind? Call him that he may eat bread with us. And Moses was content to come and eat bread with them and to dwell with the man. And he gave Moses Zipporah, his daughter, in marriage. Now, the Torah itself clearly states that Moses was an Egyptian. I mean, there's not very much argument we can do with that. On tour in Israel, I've been twice, and the guide that took us throughout the area, took us, showed us different busks and statues of Moses, and uh, there where they keep the, uh, the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, right in that vicinity, and showed him as a very dark, bronze-complexioned man, and I asked him specifically. I said, do the people of this land respect Moses as being black? He said, yes, it's common knowledge. <laughs> they respect him as being black. Then we have another scripture that says Moses was fearful that he could not meet Pharaoh, that he was not eloquent enough. So the scriptures say God told Moses to take his hand and stick it in his bosom. And then Moses took his hand out of his bosom and it turned as white as snow. <laughs> and then it said God told him to stick his hand back. And he stuck his hand back and it turned back like it was at first, which means it was other than white as snow right. at first. But let's move that to the side for a second. We want to go back to the origin of this. The Jews, as they are called, the original Jews that were in Egypt were no doubt a people of African descent and African origin. Now, which came this Johnny come lately Jew. Where did he come from? When did he come in the picture? He is a European who after the grafting process took place in the Holy Land was driven as a chalk. We got no white chalk. Everything white running nowadays. We got He was driven into the caves and hills of Europe. The prefix EU means caves and hillsides. Rope is the rope to bind in. They were confined to the caves and hills of Europe, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us, for approximately 2,000 years. There they went savage in the caves and hills of Europe. They crawled around on their all fours. They ate, they ate juniper roots. They ate their meat raw with the blood running out of them. That's right. They just knock an animal in the head and jump on him and savagely bite him and eat him. Oh, right in the right. caves and hills of Europe. Right. And leave the old animal's decomposing body and the stench from that body coming up in the cave. They would do their number one bathroom duties. Oh. Number one and number two right in the cave after leaving the old animal in there that they had finished biting on. Mm. They did this for 2,000 years in the caves and hills of Europe. But it was Moses, the great emancipator or civilizer of the white race, that gave them knowledge, that gave them culture, that gave them refinement and civilization. And this people who call themselves Jews today benefited from the teachings of Moses, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us, more than any others of the Gentiles or those who did not follow Moses' law. And then they became hated by the rest of the white folks of the world because everywhere they went, they went in low profile, but they had Moses teaching and his law and his refinement rooted in them. So they would grow right up in that society and before you knew it, that Jew had taken over the, he was influential in the monetary circle. He was influential in the whatever form of media and communication that existed there. He was influential in every major branch where there was to be any influence. The Jew had eased right up in it, the so-called Jew, and supplanted the society. 
So then whites became angry, the other Gentiles. They became angry with this so-called Jew who had benefited from Moses' teaching. So everywhere he went, he was kicked out. Everywhere he went, he was kicked out. Hitler hated the Jews in Germany because the Jews were so shrewd, so sharp, so wise. And the Germans, the Aryan race, were claiming to be superior to all white folks. But theirs was just a claim. The Jew was controlling. The Jew was influencing. The Jew was manipulating while the Germans had their chest stuck out. But no egotistical majority will allow a minority to rule them for very long. So old Hitler, another devil, rose up and started trying to crush the Jewish influence and power that had grown up right in the midst of his people in Germany. He couldn't do it right away. He moved over a period of time until ultimately it finished or culminated in killing millions of his white brothers who are called Jews today. Now I heard Professor Garber say that no other people in essence had suffered more and that they lost 10 of the 12 tribes in Assyria. Oh, that indeed is ego. You have not suffered like the black man and black woman of America. There's no way on earth you can say you have suffered. What is six million? We lost 250 million in the Middle Passage just between Africa and America coming over on the slave. Read Sheikh Antidia, African origin. Read Dr. Yusuf Ben Yakinen, black man of the Nile. Read Dr. Walter Rodney, how Europe underdeveloped Africa. Read H.G. Wells. Read Sigmund Freud, who tells you that Moses was an Egyptian. Let's go to Freud. Come on, come on. Go ahead. First, the noted Egyptologist James Breasted pointed out that Moses' name was not Hebrew as conventionally accepted, but it was an Egyptian word, Musa or Mosa or Mose, meaning child or boy son, to which a prefix of a god's name, no doubt had been attached and lost over the years. Both Sigmund Freud in his book, Moses and Monotheism, and Howard Fast in the Jews agree on the Egyptian origins of this name. To begin with, Freud says, and to begin with, uh, James Breasted says, the circumstances of his birth as, as portrayed by the Old Testament, really betrayed, are pure fantasy. Exodus 11, 1 through 10. Actually, in ancient times, and I want to stop, because the rabbi said, he said he didn't believe that it was all scientific. He said it himself. He said he didn't believe it was all factual and scientific, but he believed that it was a compilation, in essence, he said, of the myths and those elements of the culture that held his people together and gave them a sense of belief in their God. I quoted him word for word if I have to go back and pull or lift his exact quote. So he admits that he knows that it wasn't scientific. Let's see how unscientific it really is. It says here, actually in ancient times, African myths about finding a baby in the water, as they say about Moses, were quite common, especially in honoring national heroes. About 2,800 B.C., for example, over 1,000 years before Moses even existed, such a myth was created about Sargon of Agade, founder of Babylon. There is a similar myth about the Egyptian god Horus and other famous men such as Cyrus, Romulus, Oedipus, Paris, Telephus, uh, Perseus, Gilgamesh, Amphion and Zethros. It is likely he was the child of the Pharaoh's own daughter, for he was raised in the royal household. Moses became learned in the wisdom of Egypt and later became a priest of the Egyptian faith, receiving his theological education at Heliopolis. So the important fact about Moses' origins was not his color, however, but his African culture. Moses gives the Hebrews an African religion, 
after Moses returned to Egypt, he somehow became the spokesman for the Hebrews and introduced them to a monotheistic type of religion, mm. which he had learned as an Egyptian from the teachings of King Tut's brother, Akhenaten, mm. and which was previously unknown to them before they came in among our people. The miracles and other exodus phenomena could also be drawn from old legends in Africa about the sun, about the sun god. He had a magic rod which could change, be changed into a snake. You remember that story of the casting of the rod? He, and could be used to draw water from a rock as well. You remember that story in the Torah. He crossed the Red Sea himself without getting wet. And he divided the waters of the rivers, Orontes and Hydaspus, uh, uh, Hydaspus, by the touch of his rod and crossed that dry footed too. Now I want to document that. Bible myth and their parallels in other religions, P.W. Dawn, New York Press, Truth Seeker Company. It goes on to say, there are many examples of older African myths or other writings which allude to the same concepts used in the Exodus story, especially in regard to the parting of waters or other barriers to accept a group's escape uh, and the death of its pursuers. But the, the Jews' account was not worth the Egyptian scribes even noting says here that there's no record. I've been to Egypt four times. There's no record of this stuff anywhere except in the hearts and minds of the so-called Jews who exist around the world who are trying to establish a homeland for themselves, which is a question that we definitely don't want to leave out before we go today, the Jewish homeland between them Jews and them Arabs. And I know you would think that we would take the position of the Arabs. We don't take the position of either one because both of you are imposters and neither of you have any business in the area. The real land question hasn't even been raised yet. Come on. I see the audience is thinning out. See, we didn't, I don't know who chose this topic, but we came not to be, not to be disrespectful, but we came to fight. With truth, because you have lied to black people too long. Right. So I didn't wear any gun or anything. None of the brothers wear any guns. We don't have any weapons. Right. We didn't come to shoot from the hip. We came to shoot from the lip. was renowned in Hebrew lore for his psalms. You know about the psalms of David. Come on. I mean, Mother Deer used to, as we say, Mother Deer used to put us to sleep with the psalms of David. Yes, sir. Let's see how smart David really was. Mm -hmm. But as fast, here we're dealing with, uh, let me get the resource so you can look these up. I don't want to just talk here. Give me just a second. Oh, here we are. The Jews, story of a people by Faust. <clears throat> F-A-S-T. So I would say fast, but it's Faust. Faust points out here that King David was renowned in Hebrew lore for his songs. Shake out the Diop in African Origin of Civilization. Myth or Reality talks about it also. And we also get glimpses of it in Dr. Yusuf bin Yakinen who is professor of Pan-African and African Studies uh, at Cornell in New York. Says, but as is pointed out, even orthodox scholars admit that when analyzed on historical basis, the great majority of the Psalms that were supposedly written by David, that these Psalms actually come up out of Egyptian and African mythology. Let's examine some of the lines from the hieroglyphics and from the many records that are still in Egypt. You see, it's one thing for the so-called Jew to make claims and then have nothing to prove it. But we can find in the tombs, in the pyramids, in the dead, in the, uh, uh, um, in the uh, uh, what do you call it, the, um, the book of the dead, texts 
the pyramid texts. We have the concrete evidence that still exists that white scholars are digging up today. From the walls of the text of Egypt, still there for you to go and examine, hmm. where it says in David's so-called psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You remember that one. Huh? Let's see where he got it from. The Egyptian god Horus was Lord as the leader of the flock and guardian of the fold because he represented the first who rose again from the dead. Uh-oh. We even got a resurrection story here. We even have a virgin birth story in Osiris and who? And his mother Isis. The first virgin birth story and a resurrection story with Horus. Christianity, Judaism, and Islam got to go back to the black man and black woman. Right. That is why we who follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad do not follow Arabs. Right. When we say Islam, we mean the nature of the black man and black woman at a time when there were no religious labels. Right. Our nature is what we're dealing with. There were not labels until this new people, white people, came on the planet 6,000 years ago. Then prophets started. Then you had to come up with books because the people that came from the caves and hills of Europe had a concupiscent nature, a reprobate mind, a natural inclination to go against everything that was natural. So you had to have books for them, Bible, Torah, Holy Quran. They had to read all the time. You have to take them through rituals and they stand up in front of walls and the Arabs bow down. You have to take them something to put them in check Come on. because their inclination was to rule everything at any cost. The Jews have never been a philanthropic, good-hearted, good-willed, fair-dealing people with black people. You helped start the slave trade. Right. I'll hold that point. Don't let me forget it. I'll document it with three or four or five or six dollars. My goodness. <laughs> it goes on to say the valley of the shadow of death from the song. Our intent of valley of the dead in the ritual where those who suffer a second death are buried forever. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. In ritual, reading from the hieroglyphics, I take my rest in divine domain, and the still waters. In Egyptian mythology, they are the waters of Hetith, the waters of rest and peace. Thou preparest a table, from the Egyptian hieroglyphics. A table was prepared upon Mount Hetith and piled with heaps of perishable food. The house of the Lord is designated by speaker in ritual, the mansion where food is produced for me, the mansion lifted up by Shu, the paradise of Am Chemin, this is all coming from the hieroglyphics, the paths of righteousness. Two paths led up to the mansion called the double path. He restoreth my soul. From the hieroglyphics it reads, my soul is with me. Now. It goes on to point out that the, that the many of the other Psalms of David, the 104th and others, that Akhenaten, when you study the scripts of the Psalms that Akhenaten wrote, who was of the 18th dynasty of Egypt, that you can copy directly from Akhenaten and put the Psalms of David right next to, next to what Akhenaten wrote hundreds of years before David existed, and it's like he was just plagiarized by our people who came in and read and studied among our people and started a religion in the midst of our people right in Egypt, right in Africa. Right. There are many others. Solomon's Proverbs. It goes on here to compare Solomon's Proverbs with ancient African and Egyptian writing and gives you examples, a whole page of them, of what Solomon said in his Proverbs and what you can find concrete proof of still there in the text of the pyramids and the, uh, the text of the Book of the Dead and others throughout the Valley of the Kings. I have 10 minutes. But I'm going to have to stop this for a second and go into something else. Why 
do the Jews always pretend to back black organizations? Mm -hmm. Why? Because the Jews have used black people as cannon fodder. Right. Have pushed us out front on the front line to fight for things that they wanted in America. That's right. So they backed Negro organizations, not black organizations. They backed Negro organizations. Negro, when you study the etymology in Greek and Latin, means dead. That's right. They backed Negro organizations and Negro leaders. That's right. Dr. Martin Luther King, SCLC. I mean, we've got to tell the truth. Let's look at it. NAACP, according to Dr. Ben Yakunin of Ethiopia, who uh, knows quite a bit about Judaism. In fact, his whole family grew up and is a Falasha Jew. But he teaches at Cornell. He says the NAACP and Urban League were owned by Jews in the first place. The NAACP was created by Jews. The Spingarn brothers, Joel and old Arthur. And they ran it until one of them died and the other one retired. Then it was turned over to another Jew, a cousin in Boston. And he later resigned and then it went into weekly the hands of some black. So in answer to your question, any black organizations that Jews have primarily been in, they have and were in the controlling position because they controlled the money in it. All right, I want to cover just, I've got to really jump here now. Take your time. No, I can't time. take my time. <laughs> Points out here that PUSH, Operation PUSH, SCLC, Urban League, NAACP, Bayard Rustin, Jesse Jackson, all of them, and Dr. King were backed by Jews, and they kept Dr. King out front. Now today, Stevie Wonder is in Washington, D.C., marching for white folks to accept Dr. King's birthday as a national holiday. You're going to the very people who killed Dr. That's King, right. begging them That's to right. recognize you and give you a holiday. Right. If the white man wanted to give you a holiday, he would give it to you without marching. Right. If he respected Dr. King, and if he respected you, you wouldn't have to spend a thousand dollars and go and stand in the snow right. in front of the White House. He would automatically give it. Our image on TV greatly harmed by the Jews. The Jews control and influence NBC, CBS, and the major networks. Right. But they are so sly and subtle, they hide behind Brother, the scenes. That's an insult and that is bullshit. Woo! Well, the truth will make you act like that. Let's see if it's bullshit and let's see what kind of insult it actually is. Let me find it. Let's take a look at it. They say you can tell that when you throw a rock in a crowd of dogs, the only one that hollers is the one that get hit. has always been to play down Jewish influence to the degree that the majority of the prime time television programming has been asemitic. To look at three networks, NBC, ABC, and CBS, one would normally think according to the major male image projected that the networks are white Anglo-Saxon Protestant to the root, but not the fact. The most known and respected images of the airways are Walter Cronkite, Eric Severide, David Brinkley, John Chancellor, Harry Reisner, and Howard K. Smith. Only until very recently has a Jew been able to break into the elite anchor seat, and she is Barbara Walters, no more for her womanhood in a man's occupation and for her $1 million salary than for her Jewishness. Stephen D. Isaac has pointed out. Able as they are, the Cronkites, Chancellors, and Smiths have served as an emphasis for the historical accident that all three commercial networks grew up under brilliant Jews. The National Broadcasting Company, as part of the General David Sarnoff's Radio Corporation of America, the Columbia Broadcasting Company under Leonard Golderson after it split with NBC's Old Blue Network. Yet, it is not enough to document the backroom presidents of the networks. We can also look at the on-camera influence 
such as Ellie Abdel, or Abel, or Herbert Kaplow, Mike Wallace, Sander Vancourt, Howard Cosell, hmm. David Schoenbrunn, right. and others who carefully hide their Jewishness, which in effect makes their reporting seem more ob objective and impartial, especially when their subject matter is Jewish-related, Israel, Zionism, or Negroes. The major creator of today's ethnic programming has been Norman Lear. He is responsible for the most right. hideous and degrading programs and other Jews who back the network to be aired on a weekly basis. Right. The Jeffersons, Good Times, right. with the silly character J.J., right. who has no redeeming value at all. All he can do is have a dynamite. Right. Let us look at the print media, since somebody screamed that it's a lie. Gary Talit, in his important book, The Kingdom and the Power, pulls the covers off of the New York Times and calls the Times Jewish ownership the Oaks shoot uh, uh, the Oaks Suitsberger family to issue apologies for their Jewishness, New York Times. After all, to paraphrase Talis, the Times is owned by the Jews, edited by the Catholics, and read by the Protestants. The New York Times is without a doubt one of the most important papers in the Western world and is religiously read by government leaders and policy makers every day. The Times is not a layman's paper or a paper for blacks, but it goes out of its way to be labeled as a Jewish newspaper. But despite its conservative image, it is a critical yet unswerving supporter of Israel, Jewishism, Jewish concerns, and Zionism. It goes on to say that the Washington Post, it goes on to deal with Newsweek, it goes on to deal with Time Magazine, it goes on to deal with the influence of the Jews throughout the media. Not only that, my last point as I gather my stuff, is the unholy alliance that Israel has with South Africa. And from the very beginning, don't tell me anything about your Torah. Don't tell me anything about you following Moses or you following what God has taught you. You helped set up South Africa in its early stages. And if you push me, I'll give you the dates and the times I have it right here. And I'm not bluffing.